Good morning. We're going to go through a number of things, um, as was mentioned. We'll talk about all of the opportunities that are available to Chapman students in a multitude of different arenas of international education. And then I'd like to show a short 18-minute film that was actually produced uh, and directed and written by one of our graduates who also interned at the Cannes Film Festival. So you can see that what students learn is immediately transferable into uh, work and life skills outside of the Chapman environment. So we'll get started. So I have a little quiz for you, if everyone would take a second to read this. Ivana Travel has always been interested in foreign affairs, different cultures and languages. She's now a student at Chapman University and wants to know about her options for international education. So if you have a piece of paper and you want to write down the answers, we're going to go through uh, some multiple choice answers. So the first one is, should she talk to Booker Ticket, her travel agent, about setting up an all-inclusive club med trip to Cabo? Yes. Two, should she use all of her Chapman financial aid to purchase every travel book ever published by Lonely Planet at the local Barnes and Nobles? Three, should she look at the Chapman University Center for Global Education website to view international program options? Four, should she take a poll of all her sorority sisters to see which country offers the best prices on knockoff Louis Vuitton handbags? Or five, should she stop in at the Center for Global Education and meet with a friendly staff member about language course and length of stay options? Okay, so we hope that she takes advantage of all of the resources and knowledge that are housed within the Center for Global Education. Um, we, our offices are located uh, on the same side of the street actually as the law school in one of the little houses next actually to the alumni house. So uh, we have a warm and welcoming little cozy environment for the students to come in and check out what their options are. The Center for Global Education mission statement uh, derives from the Chapman mission statement and we hope to drive the university's global enterprises by providing opportunities that meet the needs and contribute to the holistic education of students. We inspire the Chapman community to look beyond their immediate borders, both mental, physical, and otherwise, and effectively serve our international and domestic constituents. The Center for Global Education has a number of philosophies. We uh, always ascribe to bring personalized attention to whatever it is we do. We provide assistance in selecting the appropriate program. The students meet with the Center for Global Education staff, the Academic Advising Center, and the faculty to determine the courses that they would like to take at their overseas institution in order to stay on track for graduation. My personal philosophy with international education is that it should enhance the undergraduate experience, not hinder a student from graduating on time. We provide comprehensive services, financial aid information, and additional resources uh, with respect to scholarship are available in our office. We communicate on behalf of the student to the program uh, to get them enrolled in the host institution. We're the ones doing the brokering to actually get the students enrolled. We host a, a comprehensive pre-departure orientation. One hour is devoted to the policies and procedures that students need to uh, be mindful of during the time that they're abroad. And the second hour is then um, given to alumni to come in and speak to the students directly about the uh, the intricacies of their particular program. Where can they go grocery shopping? How do they wash their clothes? Where's the nearest uh, ATM? That sort of thing. And then we have lots and lots of communication with the student before they depart, during the time that they're abroad, and afterwards. So your kids become my kids. I take great care of them and make sure that we take them through the entire experience from start to finish. And then I'm also working with a number of alumni uh, to work on their resumes, a lot of students come back and they'll come into my office and say, I want your job. I want to know how it is that you do what you do. So I sit down with them and do informational interviews, encourage them to go to graduate school. I work on their resumes. Um, we're a pretty comprehensive office. So the programs that we offer through the Center for Global Education are multifaceted. And I'll go through each one, because sometimes terminology is a bit uh, different at each school. So we have study abroad programs, exchange programs, international internships, and faculty-led short courses. All of the information about our programs is offered in the brochure that was provided to you in uh, the parent folder. So if you want to follow along with that, you're welcome to. I believe also this presentation is going to be published on the web. And and I have business cards up here. If you have any questions, you can always get in touch with me. So 
We believe at the Center for Global Education that this is an opportunity for the students to develop a level of independence um, and uh, do so in a safe and nurturing way. Um, so FERPA is the Family Education Rights and Privacy Act, and we really hold this near and dear to our hearts. We're more than happy to talk to parents about the generalities of study abroad, but when it gets down to the specifics, we want to be able to work with your student and guide them through the process. I'll be going through a number of ways that you can help me do my job in guiding the students through that process, um, but you should know that I can't release personal information about the student even participating on a program without their written permission, and the students can come in and sign a waiver form if they'd like to do that. Um, but we really try to encourage the students to sort of leave the nest, um, develop their own wings, and sort of fly. So terminology, study abroad programs. This is a opportunity for a student to go abroad to a host institution, be it a host campus or an island program, um, where they can take anywhere between 12 and 18 units of coursework for the same price as if they were still here on the Orange campus. So regardless of what the host institution charges, the students are all charged their Chapman comprehensive fees. So it's very, very simple. Um, the programs are housed with university partners, American campuses abroad, aboard the MV Explorer, which is the Semester at Sea program, or other special custom themed programs. We have some programs uh, scattered throughout Asia and Africa where the students specialize in a particular theme. Peace Studies is one in particular where a number of our students go to South Africa and really delve deep into um, the, the uh, post-apartheid era um, in South Africa. Most of the programs that we offer allow for students to take all of their financial aid package, um, which means that whatever they're charged here at Chapman, uh, we subtract the financial aid and the balance is uh, what's left to pay at the business office. So if your students are currently living in the dormitories, it might actually be a little bit cheaper because some of the dormitories are more expensive and we do a blended average of all of the dorms on campus. And if the student gets a meal plan abroad, then they're charged the Chapman meal plan. If there's no meal plan, then they learn to cook for themselves and maybe burn a couple things in the process. But um, all of the financial aid is applicable for the vast majority of our programs. The exchange programs operate a bit differently. This is actually a body swap. Um, that's the best way to think about it. We send a Chapman student out and we receive an international student in their place. The international student coming to us doesn't have to be from the host institution that your student is going to. We're part of a huge uh, multinational consortium of about 124 uh, universities around the world and we swap in between that consortium. Again, they're allowed to take anywhere between 12 and 18 units for the same price. Students are fully integrated into the host culture and complete um, an immersion experience, was a, which is a bit different than uh, some of the study abroad programs. And all of the financial aid applies to the exchange programs. Now I should add the caveat that the exchange programs are quite unique in that they really give a student an opportunity to perfect a language. Um, so if your student is coming in with AP scores from a language tests that they took in high school and they're continuing their language study, the exchange programs are really going to give them an opportunity to go through that immersion process, depending on what it is uh, they want to get out of the experience. So how does a student choose a program? Uh, this is for study abroad and exchange. The Center for Global Education recruits one year in advance for study abroad and exchange programs. So I'm in the midst right now of recruiting students for the spring of 2012. We do that for a number of reasons. It gives students an opportunity to really lay out their curricular choices, maybe have a part-time job that they can earn some money uh, to pay for their sojourn abroad. Um, and the registrar's office reviews all of the courses to make sure everything comes back in transfer. If students wish to apply uh, for an academic year, we do that in the fall and we cover all of the uh, semesters that they'll be abroad. The students will meet with a peer advisor to determine the best program. These are alumni who have gone on our program who are in our office as work-study students. They're incredibly knowledgeable. Uh, they're very, very gung-ho about study abroad. They drank the Kool-Aid, and so they understand uh, what a study abroad experience has brought to them, and they'll work with your student to encourage them to feel comfortable with the program that they've chosen. 
we are happy to introduce the Global Gateway, which is our database online, which manages all of our study abroad programs. Um, it's an opportunity for students to siphon through the 156 programs that we offer. They can choose programs by major, they can choose programs by continent, they can choose programs by city. Um, it's an application process uh, that is very, very easy. It's not rocket science. We ask the students to sign a number of forms, write uh, an essay, answering questions about what they feel they'll get out of the experience, and then we take the students through an interview. The interview is an opportunity for us to have a one-on-one -on -one dialogue with the students um, in conjunction with faculty members and staff on campus to really get a sense of the students, uh, their, uh, willingness to really open up and have a transformational experience. So that's what the interview is all about. Behind the scenes, we're reviewing and reading all of the applications. We're working with the Academic Advising Center and the Registrar's Office to review all of the courses that the students have outlined on their academic planning forms. And then we're informing the students that they automatically fulfill the six units of the Global Study GE that was mentioned earlier. This is something that the students would have to take courses for if they were to not go abroad. So they're automatically getting six credits for free um, while completing the rest of their units abroad. So it's almost in a sense like double dipping. They're getting double credit for things that they're doing with our programs. The Dean of Students is checking for disciplinary uh, clearance. All of the students must be cleared by the Dean of Students, so we always tell the students uh, stay, um, stay clean and make sure that you don't engage in anything crazy here on campus um, because that will prohibit them from studying abroad. Special needs are always being addressed if students have um, disabilities, uh, physical uh, emotional, mental, academic, whatnot, then we're constantly working with uh, the specialists on campus to make sure that the students get the accommodations that they need. Phase two is the acceptance phase. Students are accepted to participate by the Center for Global Education Selection Committee. That includes the folks who helped out with the interviews, as well as those of us in the office. We notify the students of their program sponsorship, and then the students concurrently apply for the program via the program's website. They have to go through our process first because we're putting a ton of financial aid sponsorship behind the students. So we want to make sure that we vetted them carefully and then we help them through the second phase of the process, which is enrolling them in the university programs and the accommodation on that campus. Significant financial obligations are made by the Center for Global Education on behalf of the students. So withdrawal from this point should be carefully considered because it can be quite costly. Constant communication between the Center for Global Education and the host university in anticipation of the student's arrival. We're making sure that they're getting into the classes that they are interested in, the dorms that they're interested in, living with the right people, making sure that their flights are coordinated and those sorts of things. Further phase two behind the scenes efforts, we're building our budget um, and notifying the billing office of which students are planning to participate in the programs so that they can um, appropriately assess the financial aid for those students. The courses are pre-selected and held for the study abroad students, so the vast majority of students are able to get into their first uh, choice classes. There's some uh, sort of moving around that has to happen with particular courses, but for the vast majority of our students, they're okay. Housing deposits are sent directly to the program, so we know exactly where the students are going to live. Then we take the students through a pre-departure orientation program. This is mandatory and all parents are welcome to attend. We go through registration and enrollment, uh, we cover costs and billing, how housing works. We uh, teach the students if they're currently in the dormitories how to opt out of their next semester dorm obligations so that they're not paying for two housing assignments during the time that they're abroad. We give them a comprehensive handbook. We have information on our study abroad page that mirrors the information that the students are given during the pre-departure orientation and it's called Information for Parents. And this is um, a handbook that I wrote in Mom and Dad Speak. So you have an understanding of what your students are going through if they're not communicating effectively with you about what's going on. So you can sort of do some background information uh, digging on your own. We take the students through a process of filling out a number of university forms um, and getting them all squared away with their financial obligations. Prior to leaving, 
we're making sure that the kids all have passports. Um, some students think that they can just leave the country with their driver's licenses, so we have to educate them about obtaining a passport. We also have to educate them about a visa. Um, when I first started here at Chapman, I had uh, gone into my pre-departure orientation program and was talking about the need for a student to have a visa. And one of the countries that I mentioned required a visa, which is a clearance document given by the host country government for the students to go and spend a significant amount of time uh, as a student as opposed to being just a visitor. And I was mentioning France, and one little girl in the back of my pre-departure orientation rose her hand, and she, I knew she was going to France. And she said, Katie, I don't understand why you have taken so much time to explain what these visas are. I mean, I'm going to use my dad's American Express, and I don't know why you're spending so much time wasting energy talking about these things. And I thought, okay. Here we go. We need to really explain what this visa process is all about. Um, so we do our best to provide information to the students about the necessary visa documents, but we can't provide further guidance to the students about how to fill out the forms because I'm not actually a representative from each one of those countries. It would be cool if I could uh, clone myself to do that. But considering that I'm not an employee of the government of France, I can't provide information to students uh, about how to obtain the visa other than just general information. We talk to the students about banking and money. This always freaks them out. How am I going to get cash abroad? Um, when I studied abroad, there were really no uh, other means than traveler's checks to get cash abroad. And now it's so easy with online banking and international ATMs and everything else. Um, we also didn't have access to the internet when I was abroad. And we didn't have cell phones. So these kids are living in the lap of luxury, in my opinion. <laughs> Um, so uh, we talk to them about all of those things in terms of making sure that they don't have atrocious cell phone bills because they're on a different SIM card uh, and all of that kind of stuff. We talk about airline tickets and packing. Girls are always more interested in knowing what to pack than boys are. They just, guys just don't care. They just kind of throw stuff in a backpack and call it a day. But the girls always want to know how many pairs of shoes to bring and how many outfits and all that kind of stuff. So it's cute. We talk about medications. Um, a number of students think that they're going to the moon when they study abroad and they can uh, just stop taking whatever medication it is that they're taking. So we, uh, we talk a great deal about mental health, um, medications that need to be maintained and how to work in conjunction with your uh, pharmacy and health insurance plan to make sure that they have enough medication for the time that they're abroad because it cannot be shipped. Um, they would look like a drug mule if uh, things were being shipped to them. So we really make sure that they're all set and ready to go. And then we have a dialogue about realistic expectations. Um, sometimes students forget that they're going to a country where um, all they speak is Spanish. And so they get really overwhelmed. And they'll call me and they'll say, oh my god, it's Spanish all day long, every single day. And I said, well, you're in Spain. What? <laughs> What is it that you expect, you know? So we really have a, a dialogue about realistic expectations, one of which is that they can't get hot water for showers. Um, that's all, that always comes as a, as a surprise. Or that every single country isn't wireless equipped like we are. Like in Costa Rica, I think they have four phone lines devoted to the internet. So um, students, you know, get intermittent internet connections and they kind of freak out about that. So what happens when they're abroad? They're adjusting to life overseas. And culture shock is something that we often talk to the students about, but they don't often get it until they actually get over there. So there are many phases of culture shock that can happen. Um, and they can happen as quickly as within 24 hours after arrival. They can go through all four phases right then and there. Or it can be a gradual sort of roller coaster uh, experience that the students have during the entire time that they're abroad. So the first phase is that they're absolutely fascinated with all of the new things that they're experiencing and they're really overjoyed to be where they're at um, and you know it's the honeymoon phase of things and they're really stoked about being abroad. Then they start to feel uncomfortable because they notice that they don't fit in. The 14 pairs of shoes that the girls packed don't match what all of the posh, you know, uh, Florentine women are wearing and so they start to stick out like a sore thumb. Then they start to reject the foreign culture and they start to judge others as being different. And oh, well, in the United States or back at Chapman, um, we don't do things like that. They get over that rather quickly because they're inundated with the other cultures uh, 
influences all the time. And then they start to feel that they can handle it and that they're learning to decipher the various customs and the various um, behaviors. And by the end of the semester, they don't want to come home. They're used to drinking cappuccinos at three o'clock in the afternoon, or you know, they're sitting on um, the banks of the Seine, doodling in their sketchbooks in Paris, and they don't really want to come home. My culture shock experience involved uh, Skippy peanut butter. I studied abroad in London, and about three weeks into my semester, I had a ravenous craving for peanut butter and jelly. Um, you just revert back to childhood comforts. And I could not find peanut butter that was like what we're used to here in the United States. They had oily peanut butter, and it was all gross and icky, and I couldn't, I couldn't handle it. So I called home crying and asked my parents to ship jars of Skippy peanut butter. They shipped four. So I was set for the whole entire academic year. Um, so you might have to go through some of that kind of stuff. Uh, they will ultimately start to enjoy and accept the foreign culture. During the first few days of the students being abroad, it's very important for you to be comforting, supportive, and rational. Please be the voice of calm. Remind them that they chose to do this and that they were excited when they left and they should uh, engage in learning because that will help them through the process. If they reject everything um, and go through the process you know, with sort of a blind eye to what's going on around them, they're not gonna have a very good experience. Please don't fan the frantic flames. Call us if you need advice. It's scary, but it doesn't have to be. Please encourage your students to stay on their medication. Um, we establish a relationship with the resident director um, on site, and so the resident director can work with your students um, if they're having some particular difficulties. But I've done counseling sessions from 6,000 miles away, so very equipped to be able to handle your students freaking out. Please remind them that there are radical differences between where they came from and where they're going. They're not in Kansas anymore. For example, uh, again, hot water is not shower uh, standard. Wireless internet is sometimes unavailable. Electricity can be sporadic. All of those things they forget about. Again, behind the scenes from our end of things, shortly after your students have left, we're making payments to the overseas institutions to cover all of their costs. We're constantly monitoring the safety and security bulletins. Uh, there was just recently an earthquake in New Zealand and in less than 12 hours, we knew where all of our students were. Uh, we send constant email reminders out to all of the students, reminding them about registration for the semester for when they would come home, about housing assignments and dormitories. Uh, we remind them that full-time enrollment in their host institution is critical. It uh, has a lot of uh, relation to their student visa status, and so we don't want them to be illegal uh, when they're abroad. So we make sure that they're full-time enrolled. And we also remind them that we do transfer failing grades. Chapman puts a great deal of emphasis on the academic component of study abroad. And so we wanna make sure that the students are taking this as an opportunity to fulfill their graduation requirements and not just a semester where they're off um, touring a country for four months. And then uh, we work with the student when the transcript comes home to make sure that they have all of the approvals that are necessary. So when they come home, they go through reverse culture shock. And students also find, often find that the adjustment period of coming home is uh, more difficult to deal with than when they went abroad. They're expecting things to be different when they go abroad, right? So when they come home, they just want to seamlessly transition back into the Orange County lifestyle, and they have a very difficult time doing that because they've seen uh, mass transit systems that are really efficient. They've seen people recycle. They've seen people um, engage in different family customs and things like that. So so we, um, we, we work with the students to make sure that their expectations for coming home are met. Um, and we have a, um, a welcome back and also a conference um, that helps the students deal with the lessons that they've learned from abroad. In November, we hosted the Lessons from Abroad Conference for the LA area, invited all of the universities who send uh, students abroad from 
Riverside County, Ventura County, LA, and Orange County. And we had a one day conference with all of the students to talk to them about how to fully integrate back into American society after they've had this transformational experience. This is common. Uh, they should not feel as though they're an outcast. They should not feel as though uh, this is anything different um, from any other study abroad student. Please rest assured that in time, your student will be able to incorporate an appreciation of the positive aspects of their host culture and their home culture. Um, and then on the back end, we're working with their transcripts. Graduation sashes are ordered. For any graduating senior, they're allowed to wear a graduation sash of the host country flag, um, and it's a really great way for students to sort of identify one another during uh, the graduation ceremony and all of their regalia uh, that they studied abroad and that they were special and that they had this uh, transformational experience. And then again, I mentioned the lessons from abroad. So transitioning now to international internships, which are a bit different, uh, they are able to get an in-depth experience in a work environment and the programs are part of a semester long program or standalone programs offered during the summer. One of the most popular programs uh, for the internships offered is the Cannes Film Festival internship um, and that's the one where Rachel uh, came home and then produced a film. The summer programs are available in multiple locations, scattered throughout Australia and New Zealand, all over London, Madrid, and Shanghai. These summer programs run for anywhere between eight to 10 weeks, and the application requirements vary. They can be offered for three to six credits. A tuition waiver is uh, available for those that are eligible, meaning they don't have to pay tuition costs for the program if they've been at Chapman for three consecutive semesters, um, and they've never used the tuition waiver before, so that can really cut down on costs. Uh, and this too fulfills all or part of the Global Study GE, depending on the number of units assigned to the international internship. So the phases of the internship application are a review of the resume, they go through the application, they submit transcripts, supporting documentation, and the submission of the tuition waiver. Phase two, uh, Chapman is working with the program to review the application materials, getting clearance by the Dean of Students, acceptance through the interview committee, and then the materials are uh, submitted to the program provider and the placement process begins. Pre-departure, mostly the same information that we provide during the study abroad and exchange pre-departure. Um, all sorts of things provided to the student to help them with the international internship experience. In-country orientations are happening. The internships are usually four days a week for seven hours a day, so the students do have an opportunity on their day off to experience the host culture. There are academic assignments associated with this because the students are getting uh, college credit for their work. Um, they do engage in a number of different academic assignments. Culture shock and transition times are addressed by the host uh, staff and support services for housing. When they come home, the final academic assignments are turned in, the employers go through an evaluation process, the programs go through an evaluation process, the students go through an evaluation process, they're graded, um, the internships are the only part of international education on this campus that are awarded pass no pass credit and then we're working with Culture Shock. Past placements, just as an opportunity to see where some of our students have been, pretty high profile places. The Royal Bank of Scotland, Universal Pictures, um, ETV. In Australia and New Zealand, they're working with the Sydney Film School, uh, Basketball Australia, for any of your students who are interested in athletic training. Travel courses. Travel courses are faculty-led short-term study abroad opportunities. And they are led by a number of different faculty each January and summer term. They're usually uh, one to four weeks in length and the course might have additional classroom uh, time here on the Orange campus either before or after departure. These two satisfy part of the Global Studies uh, GE curriculum. And with these as well, the students can uh, take part in the tuition waiver program. The role of the travel course liaison. This is a person who works in our office that works in 
tandem with the faculty to make sure that the travel course is set up appropriately uh, with respect to all of the administrative processes. And then we provide safety and emergency contacts to the students and the faculty prior to departure. So it's really a collaborative experience between our office and the work of the faculty to make sure that the students have a, a, a good experience. We administer all of the forms and we work with all of the uh, students and the faculty. Thus, the role of the faculty is to uh, work with our office and enroll the students in the course. They're the primary point of contact during travel. They teach the academic content of the course in an international setting. And they communicate with the students about culture shock um, and develop the relationship with the students over the course. Typically, they, the faculty co-lead the pre-departure orientations with us uh, to make sure that all of the bases are covered with the students. Travel courses tend to be um, a gateway into getting students to go on semester programs, but they can also be a fantastic complement after a study abroad semester. Typically, there's a $500 non-refundable deposit that's due prior to the course leaving. And the payment deadlines are just shortly before departure. The range of travel course fees depends where the students are going and for how long, but they can range anywhere from $1,500 to $6,000. Um, we have an eight-week travel course that uh, is on the more expensive side of things, but it's eight weeks long. So this is our contact information. Um, I work with the overseas programs, as does my colleague Christy Beavers, and then uh, our colleague Lauren Brown is responsible for the travel courses, so our contact details are there.